And welcome Jenny back Lee to the Summer, everyone. If you are just joining us, I hope you've been enjoying all the sessions. Uh, we've had an amazing journey so far. We've had an exclusive peek at the newest and most exciting accessibility accessories now on the shelf just behind me uh, and in Windows and two rounds of action-packed breakouts and a lot more besides. We still have a lot more to come with another round of breakouts uh, and another keynote session. So do hang in there. Make sure that you're well fed, well watered as we go through. And I have to say, I just love all of the comments happening on Twitter, hashtag Ability Summit. In fact, I'm gonna pull up a couple of them that just made us smile in the back room. Uh, this one from OT Unleashed. I'm not crying, you're crying. This is such a groundbreaking day for humanity. Oh, Eric, we got the same. Um, the next one was beautiful as well. This was from Antonio Martinez, Black1976. Just saw Ability Powered on Ability Summit and the new adaptive tech for mouse and keyboard. That looks amazing. I use mouse all the time. This is great for so many of us. Woohoo! Love it. And Mike Davis. Um, in fact, Mike, I think you channeled a lot of the feedback that we're hearing. I think there's going to be a long line of people wanting to visit the Accessibility Lab. This was Mike Davis, 1003, Ability Summit, incredible work. I'd love to visit the lab. The new adaptive input device looks spectacular and so impressed with the levels of research and engagement that's gone into the design. So cool and inclusive too. Um, oh, it's just fabulous to see. Please keep tweeting. Please, if you need help at any point as you go through this, don't, don't hesitate to email us at ability at microsoft.com. The whole team, we're watching that right now. Uh, I've also been educating them for those that were wondering on what Doctor Who is um, and what a TARDIS is. If you don't know that, where have you been? Uh, but up next, we have a couple of incredible topics. You asked and we listened. So for the first time, we are bringing developer to the keynote stage. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to empower developers to create the most accessible technology needed to ensure everyone has what they need to achieve their goals. We need developers to develop accessible code. That is the principle of shift left. And we need to make sure that people with disabilities have the tools and training to become developers. This is one of the biggest growing talent pools out there. We can't think of a better person to lead this than our own corporate vice president of product, uh, Amanda Silva. She is the CVP of our Microsoft Developer Division. So, Amanda, welcome to Ability Summit. Thanks, Jenny. Amanda Silva. Hello, I'm Amanda Silva. Shoulder length black and I hair. Product for the Developer Division, which includes developer tools like Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and .NET, along with Microsoft's first party engineering system. Microsoft's mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more, and shipping accessible products is an integral part of this mission. We embrace the full spectrum of human diversity in how we make products aiming to build equitable experiences. A recent survey shows nearly one in five Visual Studio developers disclosed a disability of some kind. When you think about our customer base, that's more than a million developers who have a disability. We understand the opportunity in enabling all developers to achieve more and how furthering these experiences can propel people into the jobs of the future. With me today is Juanjo Montiel, a senior software engineer here at Microsoft. Let me introduce you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Juanjo Montiel. A white man in his late 30s. I've been a developer for more than 17 years. I'm also a blind person. So I may use the technology in ways you uh, would never have thought of. However, I started this journey when I was 14 years old, more or less. And I remember that I wrote my first line of code by using Notepad, Notepad application. After that, I started uh, programming with Visual Basic 6.0. And although it has a lot of accessibility issues, I was able to develop more comfortably. When I started, um, Working professionally in 2007, I started using Visual Studio 2005, and I even was able to uh, debug code in an accessible way, which was fantastic because I was able to stop using console right line print everywhere. Thank you, Juanjo. 
Prior to joining Microsoft, he was part of the MVP, Most Valuable Professional Program, that recognizes technology experts and community leaders to partner closely with Microsoft products. Through these types of collaborations, we learn more about different behaviors and discover ways to make products better. Developers are constantly looking for optimizations to write faster code with fewer errors. One way we enable confident development is through AI for Code. AI for Code harnesses the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning to suggest smart code completion, streamline repetitive tasks, and reduce the chance for errors. Let's check out how Juan Ho uses whole line completion to quickly add app functionality. For example, if I'm going to start um, writing this feature of update phone, I can do something like, for example, a screenshot bar on number equal to Suggestion colon away underline user manager dot get phone number a sync left parent user right parent semicolon. Typing code. Okay. As you can hear, the screen reader is reading me everything, the punctuation, the indentation, the completion. But in this case, this suggestion is not exactly what I want because I want to get the user Sug dot suggest phone. Phone, no phone number period. One exactly, two. phone number. R. Blank. And then I press enter. Suggestion colon if left parent model dot phone number exclaim equals phone number. I press tap, now enter, open brace, and then suggestion colon model dot phone number equals phone number semicolon. Okay, it's not bad, but it's not exactly what I need because I'm going to update the model by using a method. Blank. So Blank. left margin, left brace, Blank. I am going to do something like bar set phone result equal to, and let's see. Suggestion colon away underline user manager dot set phone number a sync left parent user comma phone number right parent semicolon. This is exactly what I need. Thank you, Juan Ho, for showing how whole line completion generates the code you need. Next, I'd like to give you a preview of our newest AI for code experience, GitHub Copilot. Copilot doesn't just stop with a line. It synthesizes entire blocks of code in an instant. GitHub Copilot is trained on billions of lines of public code and works across a broad set of languages to help you save time and stay focused. By extending the editor, GitHub Copilot puts the knowledge you need right at your fingertips so you can tackle a bug or learn a new framework all in one place. You're always in charge as GitHub Copilot provides the alternative suggestions, allows for manual edits, and it even adapts to offer suggestions that match your coding style. Microsoft makes it easy for developers to add artificial intelligence into applications through Azure Cognitive Services. Cognitive Services brings AI within the reach of every developer and data scientist with customizable and pre-trained models built with breakthrough AI research. All it takes is an API call to embed the ability to see, hear, speak, and more right into your app. Unlock captioning and dictation capabilities with speech services or utilize language services to enable apps to interact with users through natural language that can power chatbots or voice assistants. Vision services can extract rich information from images and video and can even identify people and emotions using the Face API. Microsoft Edge took advantage of vision services by providing auto-generated alt text for images that do not include it, so that users of assistive technology understand the meaning of images on the web. And finally, the Azure Immersive Reader. The functionality that users know and love in Office products and Edge is available as a service to help everyone read and comprehend text with features like read aloud, language translation, and text highlighting. Schoology is one of the leading learning management systems in North America, and it's used by tens of millions of students. By integrating the Immersive Reader, now students can inclusively access assignments, pages, and other content in Schoology. Considering these endless possibilities for application creators, it's important that developers can focus on building new functionality and not time-consuming tasks like setting up environments. GitHub Codespaces is one of our latest innovations that helps to remove some of the barriers. Now, you might think that setting up an environment is a once-in-a-job task, but many developers need to do this regularly to investigate a bug or to learn about a technology. 
With CodeSpaces, users can have the full power of Visual Studio Code on their dev box or in their browser in just a few clicks. With high-performance virtual machines that start in seconds, there's no need to worry about personalizing the experience since all the settings and extensions are automatically synchronized with your settings. We've learned a lot over the years about the preferences of our users and ensuring that the tools we ship can meet the needs of everyone. Now let me introduce you to one of our community members, Jeremy Sinclair, who will show you the customizations he uses to be most productive. I'm Jeremy Sinclair. You may know Paul me Black male, as white polo shirt. anime obsessed ADHD developer. I've been developing for over 15 years. I'm a Windows Insider MVP, and I also love Windows on ARM. I'm currently employed as a .NET developer with a focus on ASP.NET Core at Oric, Harrington, and Sutcliffe. I think I have some tips and tricks for you. First, you want to make sure that your environment is configured the way you want it to be. As you see, Code I have on a computer all screen. Of my windows configured in the way I want them to be. I have my error list, my output window, and my solution explorer. Everything is perfect for me. Another thing that you want to get acclimated to are the keyboard shortcuts. I would say the best keyboard shortcut is Control Q. This is the universal search. And another thing, this item I have highlighted, the turn track active item on or off, I would say this is the most important one. By simply having this item selected and enabled, anytime you have an open document in your Visual Studio, it's going to track it on the Solution Explorer. So there's no more finding where the file is in the Solution Explorer. It sets it there automatically. And the last thing, Themes. If you notice, I have dark theme. Go to Tools, Theme, set dark, and we're ready to roll. Thank you, Jeremy, for explaining how you tailor Visual Studio to power your work. To be most productive, developers need environments that not only support fast coding, but also provide a single place to focus on all of the tasks that need to be done, including collaboration. Visual Studio Live Share is a real-time collaborative tool that offers the ability to co-edit, co-debug, and chat with your peers, and so much more, all without changing how you do the work. It doesn't matter what type of app you're building, what language you're programming in, or what operating system you're on. With Live Share, you can instantly share your project with your peers from the comfort of your tools. As well, Dynamic audio cues enable everyone to share in this experience. Now let's collect back with Juan Ho and Jeremy to see how they work together to fix a bug in their code. Yeah, Juan Ho, I see this HTML has lang portion in the Accessibility Insights report. I know what the other ones are, but I don't know about this one. Can you help me out with this? Yeah, let's see. Now following Jeremy Sinclair file underscore layout dot yeah. cshtml line two. One second, I'm following you. We are in line two. Let's okay, so let's HTML greater. Ah, okay. So Code yeah. on screen. Uh, this accessibility issue is because um, uh, in each uh, HTML tag we have an attribute called lang. Uh, this is the attribute which define the language of the document of the or of the specific task. No. So okay. in this case. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need to put the lang of the entire document so that the screen readers can understand that the whole document is in English because the screen reader has the ability to uh, change the speech synthesizer, the speech synthesis to the specific language. So here, if we put lang equal to n, when you access to the page with the screen reader, the screen reader will read everything with the English voice. So wait, wait, wait. So, so hold up. By setting this lang equals en, I can completely set the language for the entire document and the screen reader just picks it up just like that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Awesome, but uh, if I scroll down here, I see a line here that's in Spanish. Um, should I just be able to do lang equals es and that fixes it? Okay, let me see. You are now following Jeremy Sinclair file underscore layout dot CSHTML line 47. Yeah, 
Oh man, it's so great that Live Share makes these noises to let me know what you are doing. Twenty plus div class equals quote dash dash app dash footer dash text hidden dash access quote lan equals quote s quote greater. Exactly, lan equal s, so that the screen reader, when it reads out this sentence, it will change the synthesis to Spanish automatically, which is which is nice. Lan greater. V. Okay, that's actually uh, really awesome. You know yeah. what, Juanjo? I think I can take it from here now. Thank you, Jeremy and Juan Ho, for quickly addressing the accessibility issues in your project. Accessibility Insights is a suite of free open source tools that can help everyone ship more accessible experiences on Windows, Web, and Android. Accessibility Insights helps you catch the most common accessibility issues in less than five minutes, and it provides visualizations and information on how to fix issues, and it even points you to the right snippet of code. The Accessibility Insights tools can help you test keyboard navigation and assist users to complete a full assessment against the latest accessibility standards. With the Accessibility Insights GitHub action, powered by Axe Core, developers can shift left even further and can find issues at pull request time. Tools like Accessibility Insights support net positive experiences that reduce friction and allow products to reach a wider market, improve satisfaction, and drive success. Today, we delved into ways developers are empowered through Microsoft technologies, starting from innovations in AI that support faster and more confident coding, to Azure Cognitive Services that power advanced capabilities in any application. We covered productivity improvements with GitHub code spaces to reduce setup time and customizations that make work easier, and live share to simplify collaborations. Finally, if you have not yet tried Accessibility Insights, I encourage you to install it on your browser or desktop and experience the difference it can make for shipping more accessible software. With today's job market, there's a growing demand for software developers that's only expected to continue as technology powers more work. There have already been great advancements in enabling more people to become developers, and I'm really excited by the features we shared today and for what's to come so that even more people can take on this work. My personal career mission is to unleash the creativity of all developers, and I'm grateful to work at a company and on a team that creates inclusive and accessible products and tools that empower developers to achieve more. Thank you, and I'll hand it back over to Jenny. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, isn't that kind of cool? Even if you're not a developer, you got to admit this is some really important stuff. If you develop accessibly right from the start, you're going to get accessible output, and that's inclusive. Um, so thank you, Amanda. Time for a quick change. I put my gaming and disability shirt on uh, because we are going to start to move into the really awesome world of gaming. First up, actually, our first in a series of three videos of amazing employees. Um, and this is a series that Jessica has hosted. Um, and the first you're going to meet is someone that I've known for a long time. Um, she does an incredible job in Xbox. She is a vice president, an engineer, and a longtime advocate. And I won't say any more. Let's meet Angela Mills. It is my pleasure to introduce you to a 26-year employee, a technologist, a certified co-pilot in training, and a senior engineering executive here in gaming. Angela, welcome to the Ability Summit. On separate screens. Thank you for having me, Jessica. So Angela, you and I met way back, back when Ability Summit was in person. Actually, before I even worked at Microsoft, I snuck into one of your sessions. Fast forward today, you are now the most senior blind executive here at Microsoft. Congratulations. Thank you. Today, as an engineering executive, describe your day to day. Where does disability and accessibility play in a role in what you do? Angela Mills. Um, so I'm currently the VP of program management for our game creator platform and experiences team. Um, so the team I'm part of is we own you know, all of the technology that people use to build uh, video games and kind of create th those player experiences that, that enable uh, video game acquisition. 
And so obviously one of the things I'm particularly excited about is a lot of the innovation uh, that's, that's going on at the moment around your know, gaming and uh, game accessibility. Um, my day-to-day -day job, you know, I spend a typical you know, senior leadership job. Um, you know, I'm setting vision, helping to define strategy, aligning teams, you're know, making sure they're on track and, and, and kind of keeping the, the team on block. And I obviously spend you know, a lot of time and energy thinking about how to build like a great inclusive culture uh, on my team. The disability kind of plays in in a couple of ways, obviously, as both, you know, strengths and, you know, there, there's some challenges um, that it brings. You know, I spend a lot of time in meetings. You know, I spend a lot of time in um, office, you know, PowerPoint, reading, reading documents, trying to, to read and synthesize a lot of complex data. I, I use screen magnification. I use um, text to speech. But there's a lot of things that are much harder um, for me to do. And, and frankly, there, there's you know, a lot of cases where I just have to spend more time getting things done. And, and for sure, you know, gosh, if there's you know, issues with the accessibility technology or if we change one of our applications or some of the, 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 the accessibility and the accessibility stuff isn't working. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm literally uh, you know, dead in the water. Um, on the positive side of things, you know, there's uh, I'm not confused at all that there are skills and experiences that I've had as a result of my disability that make me better at my job. And, you know, I, I truly don't believe I would be in this position today if I did not have uh, the, the issues of my eyesight that I do. It's, you know, every day when I'm you know, taking a step. Uh, I'm doing it on unlimited data, you know, that ability to be able to make quick decisions on very limited uh, information. You know, on a daily basis, you know, I'm getting myself into to situations where, you know, I, I, I set out to go do something and, and I hit roadblocks, I hit challenges. It didn't go the way I, I planned. And having that ability and having built that muscle to be able to kind of quickly recognize it's like, wait a minute, Things aren't going how I planned. Stop, reflect. Do I need to take a course correction? I, I think you hear this as a theme a lot with people with disabilities is you know, just that creative problem solving uh, that, that we've all built. You know, I, I use that every single day. 100%. Absolutely. My experience, too. Those strengths, those challenges all make up who we are. Tell yeah. me how that has impacted your leadership philosophy. They, um, so, you know, honestly, I mean, for years, um, I did everything that I could do to hide my disability. And again, I think this is a common theme where for many years, you know, my life and career experiences kind of trained me that no good uh, came out of uh, disclosing um, my, my disability. Um, I think that one of the things that is incredibly important for, for leaders is you, you have to be able to establish trust uh, with people. And a huge part of that is authenticity. And I truly believed that I was being authentic um, without really understanding, you know, when I was hiding such a big part of me and who I am and what I was dealing with every day, the negative impact that that, 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 that had. And so it's very quickly kind of the, the story that was kind of pivotal um, for me in this is, you know, Jenny had been uh, encouraging me for some time uh, to be more open um, and to be a more of, a, of an ambassador for employees with disabilities, people with, with, with disabilities. And so a few years ago, I changed team and I was asked to introduce myself at the all hands in front of the whole team. I, and I'd asked my husband, I said, you know, hey, do you think I should tell them about my eyesight? And he said, absolutely, yes. The, he said, if you don't tell them, they're going to think, you know, when you when you ignore them in the hallway, when you don't make eye contact, you know, they think you're going to be, you're being aloof or you're being weird. Whole other conversation about why it took him 30 years to tell me this. Um, however, so, but I did, and I stood up in front of the whole team and I explained my disability and some of the things that helped me fully participate in meetings. And he was like, hey, you know, I won't recognize you in the hallway if you see me and I, and I ignore you. It's like, just say, you know, hey, hi, you know, it's 
say your name um and like i'll know it's you i'll, I'll know you're there oh my gosh I, I was so nervous before I, I i i did this as well it was transformational and in much broader ways um that, that than i thought obviously you know it it helps people help me and so they can now get you know i can spend more of my time bringing the best of myself um that the value that i bring um they but it's really helped kind of build that kind of you know, the, the inclusive culture and really helping to teach the people around. It's like, hey, if you encounter someone with a disability, they encounter me now every day. And it's like, here's how you can offer help. You know, here's how to recognize when people might be, be struggling a bit and really kind of helping to, to teach them that, you know, when you encounter these, these, these types of situations, like here's how, how to deal with it. And of course, it helps me you know, be a, a much better you know, role model, hopefully, uh, and show more people with disabilities that it's like, hey, you absolutely can reach uh, you know, the highest levels uh, in your career. I love that. I think what we need more of is that leadership vulnerability that you're describing. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing your story. I know that there are a lot of folks out there who want to take their career to the next level. What is one piece of advice you have for the future of disabled leadership? I'm going to cheat and give two. Uh, <laughs> I think that first one, because you, you see the thought, it, it, vulnerability. Like it, it's the vulnerability in, in leadership. Like it's so important to helping to build an inclusive culture. And they, you know, showing your vulnerability, like it's always scary. I promise you, it doesn't get any less scary uh, the, the further that you, that you go in, in your careers. As I would say, you know, think about being an authentic leader. Don't be afraid or try not to be too afraid about showing your, your, your vulner, vulnerabilities. Um, the other piece really is around that knowing your strengths. And, a, and I know this is true for every uh, person with a disability, is they, you know, we all have strengths. And the things that we have learned to, to deal with in, in living with our disabilities, like that's taken some of those strengths to absolute next level. And those strengths, like those are the things that are going to propel you through your career, like love them, foster them, use them every day. Thank you so much for sharing with us, for your leadership, and for raising up that next generation with you. We really appreciate you being here, Angela. Thank you. Thank you for having me and have a wonderful Ability Summit. Hey, thank you. Isn't that awesome? I think the power of disability, and disability is a strength, is what really shines through. And I love that Angela took that step uh, to be more open because, well, that's leadership, uh, and it's important for us all to see people that are just like us. Now, Jenny we're going to stay Flory. in the gaming world, but we are going to shift just a little bit into a really cool segment that is going to go deep into gaming accessibility. You've heard from Angela. We're now going to hear from Corporate Vice President Sarah Bond, and we're going to talk about how to develop and how to build more accessible games and the importance of play. Play is a human right and it needs to be, well, it needs to be there for the more than 400 million disabled gamers out there. So I'm thrilled to welcome Microsoft Corporate Vice President for Xbox Gaming Creator Experience and Ecosystem. I got that. Sarah Bond, take it away. A black female with long dark Thank hair, so a purple for gaming me. for everyone t-shirt. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to connect with you all today and feel welcomed by the disability and accessibility community. You know, even at the best of times, connecting with each other is so vitally important for our health and our happiness. But over the last few years, it really has not been the best of times. But that's also why it's so important we continue to come together to talk and connect and just push to find ways to improve. Building a better world. I think about this a lot. Everest. You know, in life, we all have the power to imagine and just dream about a better world. But what I really want to talk about today is how we move from dreaming to building a better world. A world that is more inclusive of people with disabilities. And why I believe gaming 
has a pivotal role to play. I've always believed gaming has the power to make a difference, not just in how people entertain themselves, but how they think and feel. It's one of the reasons why I work in this industry. And I'd read all the research about what gaming can do, but it feels sometimes impersonal. I wanted to hear stories from real people. So what I did is I asked people on Twitter. I asked people if a game had ever changed how people thought or felt about something. I was so overwhelmed and touched that people were willing to share these personal stories about gaming and what they had meant in their lives. Helping to deal with grief and process the death of a father. A tweet from Beth Graham. People experiencing homelessness. Electric DCX. Playing online with people who have become friends and loved ones in real life. Jordy Campbell won. Causing a father to think about unconscious expectations that he's putting on his child. Langfield 77. A common theme across all of these stories is empathy. It's not a substitute for lived experience, but empathy is a spark that lights up someone's desire to learn more and take action. It's why I believe empathy is the foundation to building a better world. The empathy ability to understand is their feelings. three concepts that build on one another. It starts with cognitive empathy, being aware of another's perspective from a logical and an analytical point of view. Then emotional empathy, taking the next step and actually putting yourself in another person's shoes and engaging with people who have that lived experience. And then finally, building to compassionate empathy, taking all that you've learned and understood and translating that into the urge to act and do something. Today, in our modern world, society is more global and diverse than it ever has been. We encounter different perspectives, cultures, and yes, disabilities with a frequency and depth that just couldn't have been conceived of by previous generations. And games, with their interactive storytelling and social connectivity, have a unique power to bring people through the full empathy journey and empower people unlike any other form of entertainment. And games are the media form that young people engage with most. So it's such an important and powerful tool. But everyone plays differently, which is why it's imperative that creators and platforms invest in accessibility features in partnership with the disability community that remove barriers to play, including features like the Xbox Adaptive Controller, in-game ASL or BSL support, color filters or night mode, What's so special about this is that it empowers a new level of engagement with the game and with one another. It's the power of play. And with 400 million gamers with disabilities, it's also a responsibility. A game is a beautiful combination of art and science. There's actually a ton of math in games. And when my mathematical brain thinks about what creates empathy, this is what comes to mind. Empathy comes with a combination of proximity and collaboration amplified by play. Proximity, that's exposure, access, and inclusion of people with lived experience of disability. Collaboration, that's working towards a common goal with someone else. And when you bring those two things together and amplify it with the bonding that comes with play, you end up creating empathy. And that's magic. Let's start by breaking down and starting with proximity. Contact theory has proven that contacts between two groups, proximity between people, reduces prejudice and promotes tolerance and acceptance. We need more exposure to each other. We've learned that we need to hire and listen to people with disabilities, more opportunities to notice the world from someone else's perspective. You can't really understand someone else's experience until you try and actually understand it. The entertainment we consume can have profound impact on what we think and feel. Of course, we all love delightful entertainment that's pure fun, but we also turn to media to help us learn, experience a story, share perspective, and ask questions, even if those questions are hard and can make us feel uncomfortable. We want a culture where everyone perceives their disability as a strength. 
Online multiplayer games go a step further, making it possible for people to collaborate, connect, interact, and achieve things that were once impossible. Games can allow us to connect with people across huge divides. We can complete quests, escape a dungeon, or build a city. Working together with people we've never met in person, they can live on the other side of the world, irrespective of gender, culture, ability, or language. We are all born to play. From our earliest age, if it's tag or ring around the rosy, playing is how we learn, how we form bonds, discover the world and ourselves. Whether you play to compete, socialize, escape, or just have fun, playing games is fundamental to what it means to be human. Play is an empathy multiplier. So if you think about the power of play, and you think about it as an accelerator of empathy, you can understand how important it is to us at Microsoft to build games for everyone to play and offer tools for creators to make more accessible experiences. We recently announced a new world and Minecraft education edition called Buildability that will be available to millions of educators and students worldwide starting in May. Welcome to Buildability with Minecraft, a new world for Minecraft Education Edition that helps students recognize and eliminate accessibility barriers in their school and community. Explore a school building. Barriers faced by people with disabilities by meeting characters who reflect our real world. Then, using the magic of Minecraft, build spaces that are more inclusive for all. Discover a world in Minecraft that will help shape our own. Minecraft Education Edition, available May 2022, aka .ms slash buildability, Microsoft Education. The Minecraft learning experience promotes inclusive design thinking and problem solving rooted in empathy and social emotional learning. We want as many people as possible to experience the worlds that creators make. Historically, though, it has been hard to figure out which games have accessibility features or not. And we wanted to make that easier. So last year, we introduced accessibility feature tags. This is a simple system we developed in partnership with the community to make it easier for players to find games that have one or more of the 20 accessibility features, with over 400 titles already tagged. We're now adding sort, filter, and search functionality to our Xbox store, making it even easier to discover games you'll love. For creators, we recently launched the Gaming Developer Accessibility Resource Hub. Creators can go to this new hub to find answers they need to get started on their own accessibility journey. There's an enormous wealth of resources, including testing tools, developer resources, conference talks, and courses, including the free Gaming Accessibilities Fundamentals course. With this course, when you complete it, you can earn a badge that you can share on social, representing your newfound accessibility knowledge and encouraging others to build inclusivity knowledge. The Resource Hub also includes the Xbox Accessibility Guidelines, or we like to call them ZAGs, which we offer as a free resource for game creators. They're a set of best practices for game accessibility. We've been iterating on these guidelines with feedback from the community since 2019. They've been adopted by countless creators to date. And now they also include the new edition of guidelines around mental health considerations. These are just a few examples of actions we're taking at Microsoft to support game creators in designing with accessibility in mind and partnering with the community to bring more accessible games to the over 428 million players around the world with disabilities. There's more to do, and we're taking more steps every day on this journey. But it's not just as simple as building an engaging experience. As I mentioned, games are the media form of choice for the younger generation. 70% of people under 25 would rather play a game than consume any other form of media, including social media. And that's why this is so important. If we get it wrong, it could generate misunderstanding, unlike anything else, which is why it's imperative 
we get this right. To do that, the creators and communities that build games must be representative of the full breadth of experiences, disabilities, cultures, and people on this earth. If we do this, we will build a new world, a world that celebrates and honors what makes each of us unique. And that will be the better world we're all dreaming of. A and small with that, globe, I'd like to invite Stacy Jenkins from Ubisoft to join our conversation. Stacy is a white a woman with brown and, and blonde wavy hair. Professional. And I'm so glad she's able to join us today via Microsoft Teams from the UK. Hi, Stacy. It's ring. awesome to see you. Thank you so much for being here, especially given that it is pretty late UK time. It's all good. Thank you, Sarah. It's so great to be here. This topic is, you know, very, very close to my heart. So I'm super excited to chat with you. Yeah, I'm excited too. This is going to be awesome. So for people who might not know you, would you mind starting out by sharing some of your personal journey with us? Of course. Um, so my path into game accessibility actually came about when I first became disabled, which was around eight or nine years ago now. Um, I was diagnosed with a chronic pain condition called fibromyalgia, and it took a lot from me. I wasn't able to work full time anymore, which I really loved. I you know, wasn't able to go out and see my friends very often. And it was actually around that time that I found streaming and content creation which was something that I could do as and when my pain allowed. And it was just such uh, an amazing way of socializing and connecting with other people at a time when I felt really isolated. And it was through that, that I got to meet lots of other disabled gamers online and learn how they played games and what their barriers were. And that's where my love for game accessibility really began. So. I spent the last few years trying to learn everything I can, loudly advocating whenever I could, and uh, eventually consulting on game accessibility and things like that. And now I get to work on it full time with the folks at uh, Ubisoft, which is just an absolute dream. So yeah, it's been wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. What an incredible, powerful story. And it really does capture, I think, the power of play and the importance of connecting with people through game experiences and what it can mean in our lives. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on the importance of accessibility in making things possible. Yeah, so I think being able to play a game is something that a lot of people can take for granted. It's something that you know people might not necessarily think about, and it's such an important part of people's lives for yeah. so many different reasons. Absolutely. You know, Maybe, you know, it's something that you like to do to relax and switch off after a hard day's work. Um, maybe it's a social thing for you to play online with your friends every week. And I know it's certainly something that, you know, a lot of a lot of people did a lot of during the pandemic. It took an even bigger role for a lot of people to feel connected to each other and to stay in touch with their family and friends mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And um I think it was it was quite interesting when that happened because it really echoed my own experience of when I first became disabled. And I think that people might not not necessarily know that people with disabilities are a lot more likely to feel isolated. Yeah. Um, for the reasons that you know I've I've already talked about. So it's just so important to give that connection and it's just so important. And gaming can be a huge, huge part of that because you know everyone deserves to have that same experience, that joy, that connection with others. Yeah, absolutely. You know, how do you think about game creators? And what what do you think game creators should think about accessibility and what does it mean to create an accessible experience? So I think part of the reason that I love game accessibility is because games are so varied as a medium. There's mm -hmm. just so many different kinds of games. Um, they can be very complex and intricate, which means that accessibility might mean something completely different for every single game. Um, it also means that it can be quite complicated to solve for. You know, it's not it's not just a simple quick fix. Um, which I think is a really great opportunity to be creative in our problem solving and you know prompts us to try new things, which is why it's such an interesting and rewarding part of the industry, I think. Yes. Um, but when it comes to you know having an accessible experience, 
what we mean by that is that we want all of our players, we want absolutely everybody to have a smooth and frictionless experience without any unintentional barriers that we might have um, introduced in our game design. So, for example, a player with low vision might be dying a whole lot because <laughs> they're getting hit by, by an enemy they can't see. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's not a challenge that we intended as game designers. We want the player to be able to see or hear where the enemy's coming from and to be able to react to that. Um, so that's an unintended uh, barrier that we've um, that that's in our game. So you know maybe we need to think about how to make the enemies stand out from the environment more. Maybe we need to uh, you know add a visual that you know shows um, a hit indicator or a, an audio cue or something mm -hmm. like that. There are just so many different ways that we can kind of approach these problems. Um, and I think often we don't know that we've introduced an unintentional barrier either without speaking to those players. So you know, finding out about their play experience. Um, so it's important to have those kind of, you know, those feedback loops open. So uh, it might be running community feedback on social media, very informally. It could be uh, drawing from accessibility reviews, which there are a lot of, um, or even, you know, bringing disabled users in to come along to your formal user research sessions and stuff like that. So yeah, there's a lot that we can do. And I think it starts with just listening really. Absolutely. And the, the thing about what you said, I think is really powerful and it's important to remember is that partnering with the community and just creating those feedback loops is really what's critical and the real unlock to understanding what players and creators truly want and frankly need, right? So as we look yeah, towards building a, a new and better world for gaming, you know, where do you perceive the future of accessibility in that? What role does it have to play? I think that we're finally starting to move away from thinking uh, of accessibility as, you know, just options, just mm -hmm. as, a, as something that we tack on to the design and more towards accessibility by design. So as part of the game's core design, which is really exciting because it's bringing about so many interesting solutions and designs. People are really starting to innovate and make some cool stuff, which uh, we're also, you know, seeing recognized in the wider gaming industry too. We're seeing games win awards for accessibility. We're seeing innovations being reported in the mainstream games media, which is awesome. Um, personally, I really hope that going forward, we're able to welcome in even more players to our games, especially communities that are currently quite underserved when it comes to being able to play, you know, big AAA games, um, you know, especially gamers without sight um, and communities like that, that I think there's still a lot of work to be done and so many people that we can, you know, work to include. And I'm just really excited about welcoming even more players and being able to, you know, give everybody the experience that, that they deserve. Yeah, it's so true. And I love what you said about making it part of the design, completely integrated from the get-go and what that actually unlocks and enables. So thank you so much for sharing your just incredible story and for all of your insights today, Stacey. It was great to meet you, albeit virtually. Uh, and I hope we get to connect in person sometime soon. Same, thank you so much for having me. It was great to speak to you. And thank you all for joining us today. We look forward to creating that better world with all of you, because when everyone plays, we all win. Back to you, Jenny. I love it. Yeah, and you know, can I just iterate something Stacy said? I, when you build accessibility in and by design, you are literally gonna open doors. And I think it's just such an important principle. And can I also say, Thank you to everyone for your comments in the chat, uh, for your tweets on uh, hashtag Ability Summit, uh, especially those who are sharing their journey with gaming accessibility and those who share that gaming is literally their channel to the world. Um, that's why we do what we do. Um, and I know there's a lot more to do, but uh, thank you for sharing. So we've talked about fun, we talked about gaming, we talked about connection, another place we have uh, opportunity and well where we're going to go now is building empathy through storytelling the media we consume can have an enormous impact on what we do and uh, those need to be inclusive of people with disabilities so our next guest I'm quite giddy about um, and she knows that uh, so where to start uh, she's an award-winning author journalist producer 
news correspondent, filmmaker, columnist for small names, small, tiny ones like MSNBC, Vox Media and NBC News. Tiny those, Liz. Liz Plank, welcome to the Ability Summit. Thank Point you, woman, Jenny. long I am dark so hair. To be spending time with you and and everyone else at, at this beautiful event, I couldn't be happier to be here. Beyond green dress. Well, we want to dig in, right? So before, let, let's start at the beginning and wind our way forward, um, and we'll get there real fast. But just a little bit on your background, because I was doing my research as a good journalist wannabe does and um you actually your passion for disability and for this whole space started in a community center in canada <laughs> right I, I absolutely yes you have done your research i feel like you have a million secret careers uh paths that you could take one of them being an amazing host i i might lose my job uh, to people like jenny uh after they see how incredibly good you are at hosting this amazing event um and then researcher and, and reporter so yes it is true i um worked at a, at, a, at a community center for people with disabilities uh before i i moved to new york and, and became a journalist and that was kind of the the path um that i was going to follow i i was actually enrolled in a social work program um, and then I just felt like something this wasn't supposed to be the exact path uh, so I ended up uh, you know getting a, a master's and going and taking a totally different sort of career path but at the same time uh, really trying to you know in in any way that I can really spotlight stories about disability rights uh, within the work that I do in journalism and really connect it to conversations that we have about gender conversations that we have about race conversations that we have about uh, right reproductive rights right now um, and so uh, yeah it, it really started fr from a young age for me I um, had a I guess a hypersensitivity or a hyper awareness I guess to the fact that community was not possible uh, between people with and without disabilities. It felt like we were put in separate places, uh, right? That at a CEGEP, which is in Quebec, for if there are people uh, in the audience who are French Canadian, you know what I'm talking about. It's basically what we call like our pre-college. Um, there were people with disabilities who worked at my college, but they were always in a separate room. Um, and I remember just always poking my head and being, who are they? Why aren't they with the rest of us? Um, and so that's basically what I why you know why I do what I do and 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 how I I think I'm I'm trying to do you know a very small part in a very big movement um, that that is really trying to, to to bring everybody together right um, and and make products for everybody make media st and stories about everybody for everybody. So on that point, what is media getting right and what is media getting wrong when representing people with disabilities? I love talking about what's right. I think it's so important to talk about solutions. And I and I do think that there's been a huge amount of progress. I mean, I've only been living in the United States and been working in journalism journalism for seven or eight years, and I have seen it go from night, you know, night to day. So there's a lot more representation, which is the number one thing that we need in media and journalism. Uh, we need more representation of people with disabilities who are in newsrooms, um, who are in publishing uh, houses, who are in film and TV. Um, that's really important. But then we also, right, like quantity is really important, but then quality is really important. The quality of the storytelling that those people and that all of us really uh, can do when it comes to stories about disability is really important. Um, I think about Emily Ledow, who I think you have her book uh, behind you, but if I have it here with me at all times, it's it's, it's my Bible. Uh, <laughs> Emily Ledow is uh, my cult leader. But um, I, you know, Emily speaks about the term wheelchair bound, right? That so often in stories about people with disabilities, uh, with physical disabilities who are wheelchair users, um, you know, this term will will be used. And she says, you know, my wheelchair is not something that takes away my freedom. It's something that gives me freedom. So even that framing, right, um, which we see and we come across with stories about disability, the more people we have with disabilities in newsrooms um, and, and, and as storytellers, the more, the, the better the stories, you know, will be, and 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 better the quality of those stories will 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 be, and also they'll reflect reality, right? That when we talk about representation, what we're really talking about is reality, right? Making sure that stories reflect the real experiences of people. I 
really appreciate you, you know, calling out language because language is actually where I found you. I've been stalking you for some years. Um, one of the first videos, it's a few years back, was one that was talking about the R word. It was uh, titled, when is it okay to say the R word? And I'll let you deliver the punchline in a second. Can you share a little, this was all about a character called Paul. Um, and, but it opened the door to a lot of other things that impact intellectual developmental disabilities. Tell us, tell us more about that and you got, you got to share the punchline. I mean, the, yeah, the, the, the punchline and the answer to that, que to that, that question is never, it's never appropriate to use the R word. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of ridiculous that we still have to explain that and that it's still being used. But at the same time, it's, it's you know, it, again, it comes from a lack of storytelling. It comes from a lack of representation. And this often separation, right? We, even within our, our our workplaces, our our, our community centers um, of, of of people with and without disabilities. And so I, I think it's important not just to, you know, I think it's important not to blame individual people, but talk about the system and talk about our education system and how we can all make it uh, better. But uh, as you pointed out, Paul is one of, has become one of my best friends. Um, Paul, I met in a uh theater class basically uh, for a nonprofit called called Collab um, and actually they did their show on Sunday so I got to see Paul on Sunday and uh, he is just um, a completely he's just his his joy is so contagious his joy for life is so contagious and one of the things that I think is really powerful about him as a person is that he embodies all of the different intersecting uh, identities really because I you know he ta he tells me people see me as one thing people People see me as having Down syndrome, but they don't see me as Paul. They don't see me as an actor. They don't see me as a, you know, all the other things that he is and really sort of, uh, yeah, so, so, so beautifully communicates and represents when he's in a room. And yeah, I, I think so much about that potential that is lost, um, particularly when it comes to, like every room is better when Paul is in that room. <laughs> and so when we have laws that make it, you know, more difficult for people with disabilities to work or more difficult for people with disabilities to travel, um, for, for, for them to participate in, in, in daily activities. You know, pre-pandemic, it was really hard for a lot of people with disabilities to just get something like this, right? For it to be virtual and for people to join virtually if they can't travel um, or, or, or don't want to travel, right? Because for people who are wheelchair users, and it's a, you know, can be a real nightmare. So, you know, there are all kinds of ways that we all lose um, when, when we sort of let ableism <laughs> run amok. And Paul just, to me represents um, the potential of a society where we really tap into everybody's potential. He is, I, I someday I want to be in that theater room because uh, his energy you are is excited. just, <laughs> his, it's just effusive. It comes across so beautifully on video. Please watch the video, folks. It's really, really good. Um, we'll, we're going to come back to videos in a second, but I do want to talk a little bit about your book, uh, which is just behind me here for the love of men uh, a new vision for mindful masculinity and it you know i read this and took away just a couple of a lot of nuggets liz a lot but a couple one i was just really hit by the layers of intersectionality every character that you have in here doesn't come with one thing um mm -hmm. it's you have gender you have race you have disability you have sexual orientation i'm um, and just some of the, the themes that go through that. And the other one was flipping the script. I, I love what you said about uh, it's not, hey, my girl can do what that boy does. It's more the opposite. Can the boy do what the girl does? And that was a real, you know, real, my, what, what are the takeaways you want people to have from the book? You know, I'm like two of many. What, what are the things you want folks to take? Oh, so many things. I, I think you you put it so beautifully. And that's what I wanted people to really take away from this conversation. Um, I, I thought it was really important to to interview men with disabilities um, and and not just to have their stories sort of in the backdrop of the book, but be really centerfold. And you know, just like any other movement, 
I think it's uh, important to follow people with disabilities, right? Men with disabilities can speak to ideals of masculinity far, I mean, just, I think, on a much more complex and, and again, through their own experience, a, a really interesting way. And I learned the most about masculinity, actually, when I spoke to men with disabilities. Um, Dr. Uh, Victor Pineda, who I know is a, a friend of yours and, and is a, a friend of mine, you know, one of the be most beautiful um in interviews I did really was was with him and he shared, you know, the luckiest people are the people who need people, right? But from um, the Funny Girl movie. And it's such a great line and it's such a great learning for, for I think, for all of us, but for men particularly who are not always uh, encouraged to need others or to uh, reach out and be vulnerable in that way. Um, I think that yeah, I, I learned the most from 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 Victor Pineda and, and and other men in really sharing that vulnerability and not seeing it as a, as a weakness, but something to be really really proud of. I uh, that that there's a couple of you call them amuse bouches, and one is with Victor. Um, yes, and yes, yeah, so he jumped off the page. It was just lovely to see his whole personality um, in words. It was fantastic. So l let's flip back to film because you're working on something really awesome right now. Um, and well, I, I just tell us about it, please. Your documentary. Yes, yeah, so it's a it's a short doc. It's my first uh, film, so it's, it's, I'm very excited. I'm working with um, a fully disabled-owned production company, Crippled uh, Productions, uh, with my uh, executive producers Dylan um, Buckley Crane and Sid Marcos, and we are basically making a film about the ADA, about the Americans with Disabilities Act, and how, in many ways, although it's a very important law that is hugely has been hugely impactful for the disability community and for uh, Americans at large, by the way. Uh, we have the ADA to thank for the fact that we have rolling suitcases because of the ADA, right? There were ramps. And so suddenly we were like, oh, wow, we can pull our suitcases instead of carrying them around. One of the many things that we've all gained from disability rights. Um, but uh, all this is- Any shirt, ADA nothing about us without us. And in many ways is violated on a daily basis in all kinds of different ways. Um, and then there's a twist that I can't reveal too much. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that annoying thing where you're gonna have to watch the film. Uh, in many ways, it is not just not working for people with disabilities, it is being exploited by people without disabilities. And so you will have to tune in to see how. <laughs> I love it. And I can't wait to hear your thought. One thing you know, I know you're passionate about is subminimum wage. Um, yes. And I'm sure that's gonna come into this, right? Yes, so that was actually the point of origin of the film, and it's one of those things. You know, the, the same thing happened when I when I wrote a book, and I know if there's any storytellers out there, they can relate to this. Where you go in thinking you're going to find, uh, you know, you're you're going to find one answer, and then you end up actually having ten more questions and 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 ten answers that are completely, um, you, you know, that, that that you didn't expect at all. And so, it it still does start from this um, really archaic law that, again, is a violation of the ADA that allows people with disabilities to be paid less than the minimum wage across America. So there are people right now, thousands of them, who are being paid 10, 12 cents an hour to do work. Um, and that obviously is, is, is you know, is a, a direct violation of the ADA. And I think just in general, I think we can all agree should not be legal. And so um, it started from that point. And while we are going to be exploring that, we're going to go so much further because there's, yeah, it's just kind of one part of a larger, um, I, I, I think, system that of, of discrimination that, that most people don't realize is, is happening just under their noses. I couldn't agree more. I think it's estimated something like up to 400,000 people in the yeah. States alone are paid subminimum wage. I, I'm one thing I'm very proud of is that Microsoft eliminated that from our supplier portfolio in 2019. Uh, a best practice maybe for others uh, out there to explore. Mm -hmm. Liz, I um, there's so much more. Um, and I'm so glad that I slid into your DMs many months ago. Uh, and we could have this conversation. Folks, it does happen. Um, you can reach out to your hero and make conversations like this happen. I've been um, like 
I slid into your DMs, but I, I'm fine with your version of events. Um, I was the one who was really excited and terrified. No, it wasn't. And attest to this, where I was like, should I DM her? Should I do it? So always do it. DM your heroes. That's the that's the lesson. It's a, I'm just a game on. Of We're all down with this. Well, look, I um. We're going to play people a little teaser because while we love and adore you, um, while we were sorting this out, we also found out that another part of Microsoft also loves and adores you and wants to support you and what you're doing. And you are using Microsoft 365. So actually, we've got like a premiere to show of a new little video series that you've done with our Microsoft 365 team. So I, I leave you with that and say thank you, Liz. I will see you at some point in person. Uh, and you. please, I can't wait to see the documentary. Please follow her, folks, on all of her things. Um, and uh, let's, show the video, let's show the video. Thank Microsoft you. presents 90 Days with Liz Plank. I'm Liz Plank. I'm a writer. I'm a journalist. I'm an MSNBC columnist, an activist. Basically, I do a lot of different things, which is, I guess, how it is in 2022. We all have our main hustles and side hustles, and then our side hustles have side hustles, right? We're all multitasking, we're all doing 10 things uh, all at once and doing our best. But one thing that I haven't done yet, which is terrifying to me, which is why I have to do it, uh, is directing my first film. I'm making a documentary about an issue that is very important to me, the future of disability rights in America. My partners and I shot some really great footage for the ADA anniversary, and there's still a lot that needs to be figured out for the film. I've always used Microsoft products and have been a fan because of all of the work that they're doing around accessibility and inclusivity. So when Microsoft came to me and said, what can you accomplish in 90 days, I was really excited to partner with them. And because unrealistic deadlines are kind of my cardio, I uh, decided to try and finish my documentary in the next 90 days. This rides the subway. So I have all these demands on my time because I'm doing way too much. Uh, and that's the way I like it. But I'm also realizing that there has to be better ways of managing my time. I love Microsoft 365. I use Excel and Word. I use these things all the time, but I'm sure there's a lot of things I don't even know could actually you know, make my life a lot easier. Hello. Liz Plank, 9 a.m., 30 minutes, daily team sync. Microsoft 365 is just going to give me back so much of my time because I do need to sleep at some point. That would be great, just like a few hours. So stay tuned as I continue this 90 day journey because life is short and failure is boring. Text, follow Liz's 90 day journey. Microsoft 365 logo transforms to Microsoft logo. Ah, uh, how wonder, I, life is short, failure is boring. Folks, that comes and brings this session to a wrap and it's time for me to send you to another round of three concurrent breakouts on our track pages. Review the agenda, pick the one you wanna join live. You can engage live with the presenters during that session. Don't panic, all the others will be online really soon and you'll be able to follow online and check those out afterwards. All these sessions kick off in just a few short minutes. So nothing about us without us, folks. Go and get a cup of tea. See you after the break. <laughs>